Hi, everybody. Welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop. We're back after a long summer break, and today we're talking with Melanie Carlos. Uh, today is Thursday, actually, the 29th of August, and the first week of our seminar series. And Melanie is our speaker. She's an associate professor at, in the Department of Neuroscience Developmental and Regenerative Biology, our own department here, and a member of the Brain Health Consortium uh, under whose auspices this podcast is done. And uh, so we're uh, lucky to have one of our own to speak to us and a chance to chat today about uh, her research interests. Also with us is Yuchit Baskar, a graduate student in our program, and who works with Melanie in her lab. Uh, so welcome. Melanie. Thank you, Charlie. Thank and you. Great to, great to have you as a starting, the start of the season. So, Melanie, you work on a wide variety of things. I don't want to, maybe I know too much uh, be, because I know you, so I know you work on many things, but I don't want to try to focus on everything. But a lot of it is genetic, the intersection of genetics and human genetics and uh, epigenetics and diseases and nervous system and some non-nervous system stuff. So uh, I'd like to focus on uh, Alzheimer's disease because Alzheimer's disease is one of these diseases that people are these days saying a lot is uh, about them is epigenetic. Somehow knowing epigenetics is the key to understanding <laughs> Alzheimer's disease. And they say that about lots of things, but it seems especially true about Alzheimer's disease and maybe especially likely to be actually true uh, as well. So maybe would you start by giving us a kind of rundown about why we should think of Alzheimer's disease as having an epigenetic component and what the evidence is for that and where that leaves us if we, once we accept that idea. Yeah, sure. Um, so... A lot of people think of Alzheimer's disease as being, you know, a familial type thing. Uh, we kind of hear about it, that uh, there are some uh, cases where there is early onset Alzheimer's disease and it's caused by very specific mutations. But this really only accounts for maybe 5% of all cases. Most of the cases are sporadic. Uh, there are kind of, I guess, the two major risk factors for sporadic Alzheimer's disease are really age. Uh, and also APOE genotype. But there's many other genetic factors that also play a role. Um, and there are studies that have been done now looking at epigenetic factors as well. So, for example, DNA methylation levels and really seeing that there is an association between DNA methylation at very specific sites in the genome and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but when you kind of, you know, take a, another step back and look at that in a little bit more detail, uh, what they're starting to find and kind of where the research that myself and in particular Uche is, is interested in um, is that those associations don't tend to be driven by the DNA methylation levels that we see in the neurons, but rather it seems to be driven by the DNA methylation in other cell types. Um, and so an area of research that we're particularly interested in is really trying to understand um, the epigenetics of Alzheimer's disease uh, in other cell types like uh, astrocytes, for example, which, you know, tend to be considered the supporting cells of the brain, but they have a lot of very important functions. So let me just back up a little bit onto this sort of aging as a risk factor, because if you say aging as a risk factor... I would ask, you know, what? I mean, what's happening as you age that's make you more that makes it more risky? And and if I ask most people, what about the organ they study is changing as you age? It's not, there's some small things, there's some details, but in epigenetics, you can could age an organism by its epigenetic state. And so if you say age is a risk factor, 
Aren't you just saying epigenetic state is a risk factor? So if I looked at my epigenetic age uh, rather than my chronological age, would that be a better predictor of Alzheimer's disease or worse? Well, so it's an interesting question. Um, as you mentioned, we can basically take like, you know, a set number of sites, uh, CPG sites, and from that we can very accurately determine people's age. So you can, you know, take blood from essentially anyone, uh, you know, run their profile and, you know, estimate their age. Um, it is a very way to, to measure or very accurate way to measure age. Uh, but what we do find is that in some diseases, um, and there is actually some evidence for Alzheimer's disease, is that the predicted epigenetic age is accelerated, essentially. So instead of, you know, kind of matching the biological age, our epigenetic age can be higher. Um, so this has been found in, in, you know, various different diseases. There are some publications that have looked at this in Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are, there's a little bit of mixed data, to be honest. Um, but that is a question that we're interested in answering. Um, and one of the ways we want to do that is by looking at cells that actually are already aged. Uh, so many. But if, I, but if I wanted to know my epigenetic mm -hmm. age. It sounds like maybe I should want to know that. <laughs> then uh, how would I do it? How would I, what would I look at in my genome to tell what my epigenetic age was? Uh, you can look at DNA methylation. So you can extract your blood, uh, get the DNA from it, uh, basically run it on an array. Um, you could sequence it potentially. Um, and there's basically a few hundred sites that you can kind of, you know, test very specifically. Um, and depending on your levels of methylation at those sites, that will be able to predict your age. So those, but those are sites selected out of a huge number of potential methylation sites. Yes. How are they selected? Are those sites specifically the best ones or are they just ones that were found at some point to be related to age? Yeah, so... I guess... Yeah. There's at least uh, a, a lot of different epigenetic clocks that have come up since, I guess, oh. the first one that came up probably in 2012, 2013. Mm -hmm. um, one of those were just had 80 CPG sites or so that looked at it. The other one that's more commonly used called the Harvard's clock uh, has about 360 CPG sites that they look at. And I guess the way that they came up with this is mostly looking at um, age in different tissues across the body. It's not specific to the brain or any specific cell type. It's pan tissue uh, clock, if you will. You look at what sites correlate with age across all of these different tissues and then come up with a smaller subset of you know the sites that work the best in a way. Um, so I guess a lot of uh, back-end neural network goes on <laughs> to decide which ones are which the best. Is, but how many potential uh, modification sites are there? I mean, we're talking about hundreds that are used, but mm. there's a lot. So more throughout that, the right? the genome, the number of CPG sites, uh, we have millions that to look at. Like, uh -huh. yeah, there are millions of sites that can potentially be methylated. Uh, you know, how much of a role each of those plays is, you know, and debatable. And presumably, methylation is different in every different cell type because. Epigenetics is also determining cell type. Right? Yes, so, that is correct. So that means that if we if we picked kidney cells to see how old we were, we, it might tell us something about our kidney that it isn't true about our spleen. Well, and that's the nice thing about like this one clock. Uh, again, uh, Stephen Horvath was the one that sort of defined this epigenetic clock, um, and it was based on looking at correlations across many tissues. So these these sites that we predict, you know, our epigenetic age from um, tend to be very sort of, I guess, stable or similar across tissue yeah. types. Um, and they seem to mark that aging process no matter which tissue type you look at. Uh, there are, you know, there are some, you know, we've seen clocks out there that are sort of more relevant to look at, say, fetal tissue, for example, and defining like fetal age. Uh -huh. um, there's also clocks out there looking at different animal species uh, to find, you know, how can you predict the age of, an, of a different animal? Mm -hmm. So uh, from the perspective of human aging and 
neurodegenerative disorders, one might prefer a clock that's really based in the brain or even maybe in the hippocampus or in some particular mm -hmm. sites in some particular cell in the brain. Is any attempt been made to really focus in and find a epigenetic clock for human brain aging? So from memory, I think there may have been some studies on it, but uh, the, the pan, you know, sort uh -huh. of epigenetic clock that we've been talking about, again, you can predict brain uh -huh. age sort of based on that as well. Like you can look at neuronal cells or, or different brain cells and get the DNA methylation levels there to still accurately predict age. So I guess it's a logical leap and maybe not completely logically justified, but my mind wants to jump from that. Well, if epigenetic age is, if epigenetics tells me age accurately and age is a risk factor, then that means epigenetics itself is the risk factor. There's something about my methylation state of my DNA that determines my risk for Alzheimer's disease. Is that what we think? Well, I guess to some extent, yes, but also uh, just the fact that it's not just Alzheimer's that would probably show an accelerated age. It could, it's also a lot of other neurological disorders that would show it. And there's, at least to my knowledge, and probably so far, there's no real way to distinguish what disorder it could be. So maybe you're developing Parkinson's and you probably also have accelerated epigenetic age, but there's no way to differentiate between whether you're likely to get Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. So age is a risk factor but for both of them, so you might think, you might well, still, then it's the yes. epigenetic risk factor At for At the both very them. least, you kind of would know you're likely to get a disease, or <laughs> you likely have some disorder um, by yeah. looking at epigenetic Or at least, age, I guess, yes. more importantly, risk for risk disorders, for is disorders is what we're kind of talking about. Just, you know, these, uh, when people say risk, this is the kind of, uh, what's the right word for it? It's a kind of actuarial talk. It isn't biology that we're talking about. It is, are you a, uh, are you a good risk as a, for insurance? <laughs> right? It's like, what are your chances without knowing anything about causation? Right? It's just a purely correlational mm -hmm. thing. But it's unquestionably true that age is a risk factor for all these different things. Mm. So you, if you're not a, selling insurance, but you're actually interested in the disease, then you might start there and say, okay, what is it then about age that makes it a risk? And I've heard many different stories about it. Uh, I mean, but, I think there's so many things that go, you know, wrong with age. Uh, uh, you know, you accumulate additional mutations that maybe, you know, change or kind of reduce the function of your genes and your proteins and that can affect how healthy the cells are for example um you know I guess even your diet and lifestyle throughout your age kind of matters yeah. ultimately because i mean if you've been on a unhealthy um you know way of life uh, especially like for instance people with diabetes and obesity typically also have a higher risk for diseases like alzheimer's and in a way, they're all still related to the epigenome because they're still modifying how... Yeah, that's what I was thinking of it as a kind of final common path mm -hmm. of all these things that we talk about, we call risk factors, but we don't really ever define what they are. Yeah. Like how, even healthy lifestyle, I'm sure you know what you mean by that, but it's probably not what I think <laughs> is a healthy lifestyle. So uh, we really don't even agree on uh, words that we use to describe mm -hmm. this stuff. But... I think DNA methylation is something that we can agree on what that means. So what's the roadmap for, for trying to apply uh, epigenetic, epigenetics to Alzheimer's disease? You know, first, are we looking for uh, causative uh, factors that are driving the disease? Are we looking for correlative things that we could use to predict the disease, or, uh, or, or even a, a way of fixing it, like something like editing the epigenome as a treatment. So, I, I mean, I think we're kind of interested in 
the like lactic. all of those areas in a way. Um, I mean, definitely, it's always help. It, it always helps to be able to kind of. Um, you know, predict whether someone will or won't develop a disease because then you can have at least some kind of guidelines. And because like epigenetics really does link our genetic risk with our environmental risk, right, and modulates gene expression that way, um, you know, if, if you find a way to kind of predict you're at risk for a disease, well, then you have the option to change your lifestyle to decrease that risk then. Um, so that is helpful, but in in reality, if we can identify those causal factors, you know, what actually drives the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, then that makes the perfect target for potentially treating it. Um, and so that is also like one of the lines of research we look at is, you know, in particular epigenetic editing and, you know, potential delivery systems of how we might be able to um you know, change the epigenome in specific cell types. So I'm really interested in the causal side, but because it seems to me if, the, if my DNA methyl is, methylation sites are common to everything, and you can tell it from my blood, and you can predict my epigenetic age from that, then you, everything you need is already right there, and you can collect it from as many people as you want, you probably have already, <laughs> and you already know all of the uh, sort of correlational relationships there are with Alzheimer's disease, uh, but you don't have any causal line of uh, reasoning that tells you exactly what epigenetic site is responsible for what and what combination is required to make Alzheimer's work or something like that. I'm just guessing. Yeah. That well, true? and I mean, it, it's kind of complicated because one person's risk for Alzheimer's disease is going to be very different to another person's risk. So that's kind of what makes it, um, you know, what we call a complex disease, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think one of the things to think about, we, you know, we're able to do a lot of studies, a lot of large studies, um, you know, through collecting blood from many individuals, but you know, we are in the end just looking at blood. Um, so we also need to think about ways in which we can sort of model the brain potentially uh, in a better way uh, in or through living individuals. So famously difficult because you can't take pieces of people's brain out. It is, it is, so a, it is a little kind of, hard. So. A, a strategy. So why don't you say something about that? Uh -huh. So I'm actually going to let uh, Ucha talk a little bit about the strategy. He's right. the one that does all the hard work in the lab. <laughs> Well, I mean, so especially with diseases, any late stage brain disorders, for example, um, one of the biggest things is the whole modeling aspect is when you're looking at how or what kind of models people normally use, you could go looking at postmodern tissues, but you're ultimately kind of looking at what's happening end of life. You're not looking at how the disease is progressing or what potentially is causing it or what's happening in due course. And it's similar with animal models, especially with sporadic disorders. Most rodent models, for instance, don't really get Alzheimer's, right? So you're actually inducing, you're introducing a humanized protein into it to make sure that it gets Alzheimer's and that's how you study it. So it's maybe more relevant for the familial forms of the disease, not necessarily the sporadic. So I guess, um, Stem cell models are a good tool uh, if you're looking at the molecular and cellular basis. But something that's been, uh, I guess, more common um, in recent years uh, with neurons at the very least is whenever people have taken a somatic cell type, for example, a fibroblast or a blood cell and moved it, converted it into a pluripotent stem cell um, or an iPSC for shot, uh, they typically reset that epigenetic age. So if you're starting with anybody that's, say, 70 years old with Alzheimer's, but you're generating an iPSC, you're bringing their age back to almost a zero That's state. And erasing everything you're intending to look for. Yes, you're basically erasing most of the, right. that epigenetic memory. And so any cell you derive from it, whether it can be a neuron, an astrocyte, or any other brain cell type, or even an organoid for that matter, is really looking at that fetal or embryonic developmental state more than the adult brain state. So one way to get around this is to try and generate these aged models uh, in vitro in a cell culture-based system or like in a dish. And people that tried doing this with neurons 
try to address this by taking a somatic cell type, a fibroblast for instance in this case, and directly converted them into neurons. They call them as induced neurons because they went straight uh, without that intermediate pluripotent state, which somehow just maintained the epigenome of or, or the epigenetic age of those neurons. So you start from a fibroblast that's 70 years old, you get a neuron that's about 70 years old, which I guess makes for a good uh, model system if you're looking at disorders like Alzheimer's. It's remarkable, it sounds like science fiction, <laughs> that you could take fibroblasts and turn them into brain cells, but it works. It, it, yeah, yeah, it works. So uh, there's been like a, a, quite a lot of studies that have done this with neurons. Um, and In fact, even multiple types of neurons, people mm -hmm. have just not stopped at you know, a general population of neurons. There are studies that have done specifically GABAergic neurons or dopaminergic neurons and things like that too. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, epigenetically programming the neurons to be a particular cell type. Again, that's a kind of epigenetic editing of some kind uh, by... Yeah. How do you do it? Well, so, it's typically just overexpression of transcription factors that are, uh -huh. um, you know, for a lineage-specific transcription factor, for instance. And that, yes, obviously changes the epigenome in itself. Uh, uh -huh. These are normally these pioneer transcription factors that tend to modulate uh, the genome in a way that it would uh -huh. push it towards a specific cell fate. But you don't have to leave them on for everything. They won't go back if uh -huh. you remove the transcription factor. Typically, you know, once they reach that mature state, they yeah. tend to stay in the mature state. So, yeah. or at least so far, the studies that have been done seem to maintain, so. It seems like you know more about what determines cell type than uh, you're letting on. <laughs> <laughs> so Uchid, Uchid is, uh, in my, my opinion, is, you know, kind of an expert on what determines cell types for, for at least several cells. Uh, as part of his uh, PhD work, um, you know, many people look at neurons with respect to Alzheimer's disease, uh, but there's other cell types in the brain. And as we talked about, there's this suggestion that, uh, you know, it's probably other cell types that maybe contribute to the epigenetic risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so, uh, while he's been working in the lab with me, he's actually developed uh, an entirely new protocol to look at um, astrocytes uh, and to generate these induced astrocytes uh, from fibroblasts. And there's been very limited studies done on this in the past, and those studies that did it uh, really all looked at embryonic fibroblasts, which you know, kind of defeats the purpose, and had uh, less success when they looked at adult fibroblasts. Um, but he's managed to actually develop a method that converts, uh, you know, around 50-60% of fibroblasts uh, into astrocytes. And those astrocytes show very specific astrocytic markers and functional markers that we would expect to see. So what drives you to this is the disappointment with the work on neurons, right? Well, <laughs> you for, I mean, I'm, you're looking for something, the smoking gun, well, of Alzheimer's disease. It's and, more about thinking about Alzheimer's as a more holistic disease. It's not, a, it's not a disease because of a single cell type. Yes, the effects are seen in neurons. Yes, you see amyloid beta plots thrown out by neurons and tangles happening in neurons. But for the most part, at least uh, from how it looks like, it feels like these are not necessarily causative. Uh, more and more literature keeps coming out where it points to these potentially being more downstream, uh -huh. especially because um, Disease onset happens about 10 to 15 years even before you first start seeing those plaques or the tangles, which seem to suggest that there's something that's happening way before that. There's some sort of dysregulation that's happening. And if it's not necessarily neurons or you're not seeing that effect essentially in neurons, it might be that the other cells that are surrounding it is contributing to it. But the only thing you see is once the phenotype enters the neurons, you're starting to see those, you know, uh, actually see a clinical really, pathology, yeah, a clinical you know, pathology and allowing so, you to make that diagnosis. So it could be a lot of other cells. It may not be astrocytes. It could be microglia. It could be oligodendrocytes. Uh, it could be a lot of other things. But yeah. And don't worry, microglia will be the next one he attacks. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>
<laughs> it's going to go down the list. <laughs> so what sort of thing are, are you looking for in astrocytes? Like, <clears throat> what kind of change would look inviting to you as a possible Alzheimer's disease uh, harbinger? I think um, at the very least, especially when we're looking at epigenetics or DNA methylation, uh, the most basic thing would be to try and see if you can identify any but CPG sites uh, methylate, that are methylated differentially in Alzheimer's as compared to a healthy individual of similar age. Uh, this is something that's not really been addressed or looked at as much, uh, especially even when you take out brain tissue, which is postmortem uh, in most cases, and people have done these studies, is they try to isolate neuronal populations, uh, less so about the glial populations, or the entire glial population is grouped into one bunch. Okay. So it's just made as neuronal versus non-neuronal. And you see this non-neuronal differences in DNA methylation that's associated, but we just don't know which cell type it is. So I guess the first thing would probably be to start looking at if there is an association or if there is any correlation with disease occurrence to specific uh, CPG sites or if anything is differentially methylated. So when you say specific, you mean, you know, one at a time? Because there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, do you have a lead of, uh, or is there a way to divide them up? You know, say, is it this half or that half? And once I know it's that half, is it this half or that? Half? <laughs> is there a way to narrow down the? Wow. So, you might be able to. I mean, well. In Aren't terms of the CPG matter. side, like, so I, I think part of like why we're interested in the astrocytes is, um, you know, we we talked about APOE you know, genotype being a strong risk factor um, and that has its highest expression in astrocytes within the brain. So that's kind of one of the reasons why we're targeting that particular cell type. Uh, you know, from there, when you identify or, you know, hopefully identify associations with, with DNA methylation, um, you never quite know how many associations you'll find, but it's, it's usually not like a huge number. There's usually, you know, it tends to be a manageable number um, and then at that point, you really have the option of trying to investigate, you know, are they really causative or potentially they're just correlative. Um, and one of the ways in which you can do that is to actually start the epigenetic, you know, look at epigenetic editing and, you know, start to edit those particular sites that show altered methylation. And then does that have an effect on, you know, expression of genes and proteins? Does it change the function of the cell? You know, so how do you, you have a, you have ways of methylating or removing methylation from specific known sites, like, yes, kind of like gene editing, where I go after mm -hmm. that, gene. that so side, in this case, you're going after the, that. that. Yes. Uh, side. So it, it uses so, the same technology uh, as gene editing. Um, you use that same CRISPR Cas9 system, uh, but you know, Cas9 is an enzyme. It goes in and cuts DNA, allowing you to make those changes. When you do your epigenetic editing, you basically deactivate that activity. So it no longer cuts, but you fuse that Cas9 protein with another protein, with the catalytic domain of another protein. So in our case, we look at DNA methyltransferases, like DNA, D, DNMTA 3A uh, is one of them. Um, or you look at like TET, which is a demethylase. Um, so you start to look at, uh, you know, or you can fuse those proteins together to allow the CRISPR system to sequence. kind of, yeah, you target, a, target sequence. a sequence. But instead of changing the DNA, it just methylates or demethylates that, that region. So now you've got many potential targets, but presumably, I mean, presumably you... You know something you're not telling me about what the family of proteins are that you think are having their expression changed or something like you mentioned apple E. <laughs> Often things are happening together and they're sort of families of things that change together. And once you've identified that the thing you're interested in is in that family, then you know what the other related ones are like. Is that... Is it like that? I mean, it seems to be a well, key feature of the way molecular biologists do that. 
Well, to some extent, yes, especially with astrocytes too. And this, these are a lot of studies that are either done in rodent models or even stem cell derived models of astrocytes. And when they look at things like Alzheimer's, people have seen a lot of differences in um, uh, how the lysosomes process and how uh -huh. neuroinflammation works with reference to Alzheimer's. And there's differences there. And there's also some more recent studies that came out that spoke about um, oxidative stress and mitochondrial functionality in the astrocytes that are kind of misplaced in a way. Uh, but again, kind of pointing to the whole role of APOE, it's it's a lipid binding protein. It transfers lipids to the neurons and kind of regulates that whole homeostatic mechanism. And so when you're having, you know, kind of a dysfunction in the astrocyte, it kind of tends to alter the whole homeostatic process even in the neuronal system. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what potentially drives the disease too. Uh, but uh, it just feels or looks like there's a lot or a wide variety of, um, uh, you know, functions or uh, things in astrocytes that kind of go wrong in the disease. It's hard to know um, if any of them or all of them are more methylated or epigenetically coded or if it's not going to be any of them. And uh, we're not... But at least there, you know, it's not, it doesn't leave you with 10,000 things to check, right? It's not, just reducing the number of things you have to look at. I'm, I'm concerned because there's so many methylation, potential methylation sites. You don't seem to be concerned about it at all, which means you have a secret weapon, you know, you <laughs> know something. I don't know if it's a secret weapon, but just based on prior studies, really with like any kind of disorder, um, you know, you have millions of sites that you're looking at, um, you know, only a small fraction of them. Like sometimes you might come, it might come down to one or two sites that you see are associated with a specific disorder. Uh, you know, sometimes it might be 40 or 50, or if you have very large like sample numbers, uh, giving you sort of more statistical power to detect these things, you know, you might find a couple of hundred sites, but it, it's typically limited uh, in in terms of the number. It's it's not something where you see everything kind of all go wrong in a major way. So it tends the, to be a little more are, focused. You are looking for sites that are altered, specifically altered in Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. and you and they're not going to be that many of them. That's yes, we, we don't expect that there'll be that many of them. Um, there's, there's things you can do from a statistical standpoint or from an analytical standpoint as well. You, know, you can test to see if uh, those sites are, you know, or if changes in methylation might be associated with changes in gene expression, which would, you know, maybe indicate that they have a, you know, a, a potential function. Uh, you can just look at what genes they're located in. What is the role of that gene? Is, is it likely to play uh, a role in, in Alzheimer's disease? Um, and that way you can start to, you know, even if you do get, you know, a larger number of sites that you see associated, there's ways in which you can kind of narrow down and, and at least begin to pick the best ones to start studying from that functional standpoint. So the usual functions of astrocytes are probably not the ones you're thinking about, like potassium equilibration in the extracellular space or... Well, I mean, I, I think we so could potentially know. find genes associated with those that could have differential methylation. But even things oh. like um, glutamate for that matter, uh, right. glutamate uptake. And so glutamate excitotoxicity in neurons is a very common feature in Alzheimer's disease. Right. And so it could be that the simple reason why there's so much glutamate the out there is transporter. the astrocytes are not doing their job of taking up the glutamate. And even some just preliminary data that we uh, had recently and something Mao showed today too is it's not even Alzheimer's disease astrocytes. They're just aged astrocytes yeah. or astrocytes from aged individuals as compared to those from a younger cohort of people. And we already see a drop in how much glutamate is taken up. And so it could just be that if it's somebody with Alzheimer's, it might be even lower than right. what it is in any degenerative risk. Mm -hmm. There is a high risk of that. That aging process itself yeah. already, you know, right. seems to be showing impaired, uh, you know, function of of the astrocytes. So. Well, great. Thank you very much. Um, I learned a lot about 
Alzheimer's <laughs> disease. I feel much better <laughs> about Alzheimer's disease because you know the, the field has been studied a lot, and it and to the casual observer, it's pretty confusing and complicated. And there have been many smoking guns found, which turned out not necessarily to be what they were. But uh, your approach using cells is seems like real biology to me. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, thank you very much, Richard and Melanie, for talking to us about this. Okay. Thank you, thank so you much. for having us. Thank you for having us. This has been Neuroscientist Talk Shop. We'll be back next week. We're going to keep doing this for the rest of the whole semester. We have a great lineup. See you then. 